So I'd like now to introduce Dr. Diane Meyer. Diane is the director of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI, a national organization devoted to increasing the number and quality of palliative care programs in the United States. Those lights are really bright. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Um, I want to ask a couple more questions about who's here. Um, let me ask again about regular people who are not health professionals. How many? Okay. So how many people um, ha are caregivers for someone with serious illness or have been caregivers? Any, any people here living with serious illness themselves? Okay. So you heard from our friends, um, Chodo and Koshin, that the next few days are going to be really fo focused on the inner life and on our connection and relationship with one another. And that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the macrocosm inside which that work of human connection is occurring. Because I think it's important for all of us to understand the larger context in which we find ourselves um, and of which the movement that you are a part of is inside. Um, because we are part of a movement and we need to think about it that way and we need to support each other that way, and we have to realize that um, it's going to take a while, as all important social change movements do. So um, I titled this talk Aligning Patients and Clinicians on What Mattered, Matters Most, but it, it, it could be just aligning people on what matters most. It doesn't have to be patients, and it doesn't have to be clinicians. I have um, no conflicts of interest to report. What I want to talk about is this very important notion that we care about the experience that people with serious illness are having no matter how long they may have to live. You don't have to be predictably dying to need care that meets you where you are, right? I um, want to talk to you about what we know works and therefore the things that we should invest in and seek more of. And then I want to talk about where we as a society need to go um, so that the gap that Chodo mentioned early, earlier begins to be filled. And um, this is probably the only slide you'll see with dollar signs on it in the rest of this session. But the point on this slide is to show you that right now, the United States spends about one in five of every dollars in our economy on health care. Um, and as my generation reaches Medicare age, which we are doing at the rate of 10,000 people every day, um, that number is going to go up. But what's really important to understand is that most of us in Medicare are actually pretty healthy. There are probably a number of Medicare beneficiaries in this room who are pretty healthy and don't cost any more than they did before they were in Medicare and don't have greater needs from the healthcare system than they did five or 10 years ago. But a small fraction of us, whether we're over 65 or under 65, are really sick and complicated. And we have major needs from the healthcare system. And that small group in Medicare is about 10% that accounts for two thirds of all Medicare spending. So you guys probably know about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, um, and have read a lot about what might happen to it now that the Senate has turned over. But the entire bill is really focused on improving quality for this 10% are patients, patients who need palliative care, who need spiritual care. So the work that you do every day is directly related to the health policy issues challenging our nation. 
right now. So I spent a year in Washington a couple of years ago because I realized that if, if I was serious about trying to advance access to quality palliative care, I really needed to understand the vocabulary of policy, and I didn't. After a zillion years as a faculty member at a medical school, I knew absolutely nothing about health policy, which I think is appalling, since if we clinicians know nothing about it, how can we influence it? So I went to Washington for a year, and I heard people talking about this, the value equation. I'd never heard of it and sounded really intimidating and arcane and esoteric. But it turns out it's just quality in the numerator and cost in the denominator. So a high-value medical intervention would be one that helps a lot of people, prolongs their life, improves their quality of life at low cost, or holding costs constant just improves quality. Conversely, you could hold quality constant and just reduce cost to improve value. Ideally, you do both. You improve quality, and by improving quality, you reduce cost. So what's, can somebody in the audience come up with an example of a very high value medical intervention, something that saves millions of lives and costs almost nothing? Sorry? Vaccination. Vaccination. How about clean drinking water? The major gain in life expectancy between 1900 and 1980 occurred before the era of antibiotics, which was after World War II and occurred because people finally learned about the germ theory of disease and realized you shouldn't drink water from uh, downstream in the Thames when people were pooping upstream. That was the big gain in life expectancy. Vaccines are another great example. So what, what's an example, conversely, of something that is very low value? Doesn't help people much or even possibly hurts them and costs a huge amount per person. And don't all talk at once. <laughs> How about, yeah, I mean, I was going to say intensive care for end stage dementia. I, you know, I work at Mount Sinai Hospital where a, a significant majority of people in intensive care units are cognitively impaired before they ever got there. Much worse after they get out, if they get out. But doesn't restore people to health, costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient, um, and that's where your taxpayer dollars are going. So my argument in this talk is that palliative care is one of not that many interventions in healthcare that improves quality a lot, and by improving quality, markedly reduces costs. So it affects the numerator and the denominator. It is one of the highest value medical interventions there is. Yet, no mention of it whatsoever in Obamacare. Absolutely no policy passage in support of this kind of care. And we can talk about the reason for that another time. But um, this is an actual patient of ours from Mount Sinai. These two are characters. You can see Mrs. B makes all her own clothes. And she makes a matching tie. Um, and you can see from her face that she is a character. Um, this picture was taken before I met them, um, which was two years ago. Um, I was the attending on the palliative medicine service, carrying the beeper because it was after 5 o'clock, and the rest of the team has to go home at 5. Um, so the fellow and I were still there. And um, it was a call from the emergency department attending who said, Diane, I really don't know if this consult is appropriate for you, because this guy's not dying. <laughs> this is our emergency room, right? You would think they would know this by now. Um, but this couple is abusing the emergency room. I will never forget that phrase. This couple is abusing the emergency room. He's in here for the fourth time for low back pain. Okay. So this was the story. At the time I met him, he was 88. He's now 90. Um, he had really bad arthritis of the spine, which, by the way, is the number one cause of disability and symptom distress in Medicare beneficiaries, arthritis. Okay. His arthritis was so bad that whenever he would get up from a chair or up from the toilet, he would kind of spasm and lose the ability to stand up. So 
in this instance, it was a Thursday evening after dinner. He was in the bathroom. He tried to get up. He hit the floor. So it was like quarter after 6 or 6.30, and his wife called the doctor's office, as she always does. He always falls after hours, by the way. Um, she called the doctor's office, and what did she get? It was after 5. What did the tape say? Who's abusing the emergency room? <laughs> so it said, if this is a medical emergency, hang up now and call 911. So she did exactly as she was told. She couldn't get him up. Her only daughter lives, of course, in California, the daughter from California. She did send me the photo, however. So, um, But she doesn't live anywhere near. She just worries from a distance. Um, and. She does. We talked to her from the ED. Um, he described his pain as really severe. He was able to tell us that, you know, when we asked him from zero to 10, he said eight. Um, and he was taking poisonous doses of Tylenol. His primary doc had said, oh, just take Tylenol. Now, in the primary doc's defense, this is an 88 year old man with mild to moderate dementia, right? We know that opioids, narcotic pain medicines, and people with dementia do increase risk of confusion, do increase risk of falls, that it's very challenging to safely use these drugs in that population. And this physician had had no training in the use of opioids in frail older people and wasn't about to start. And then the other class of drugs is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Motrin or Naproxen. Well, in this patient population, that drug category is much more dangerous than opioids, can cause bleeding, can cause renal failure, kidney failure, really, an, and bleeding, an unsafe drug category for dementia patients frail in their 80s. So what was left? Tylenol, which everyone thinks is safe as water. So it turns out that Tylenol is one of those drugs with a very close relationship between the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose. So you can go up by two extra strength a day beyond what you should take and destroy your liver. So a man of this age shouldn't have been taking more than three grams total per day. That's two extra strength three times a day. He was taking five grams a day. Fortunately, he had not injured his liver, but he easily could have. Um, and by the way, the Tylenol wasn't helping at all anyway. So he was just getting risk, no benefit. So it turns out we were meeting him for the fourth ED visit in two months. He had been hospitalized three times in the prior two months, each time essentially for the same reason. Um, falls, back pain, what was put on the, the code, coding for billing was weight loss, falls, and he also had a delirium or confusion from constipation. Because when he came in and was agitated and confused, it didn't occur to anybody that it might be due to constipation. So why, don't, why doesn't somebody just guess what this cost the taxpayer? Okay. Did any of these things require hospitalization? No. Okay. His wife, five years younger, was in tears when we met them in the emergency department because he was furious at her for calling 911 and bringing him back to this nightmare place. You know. Um, he said, please don't take me to the hospital. You know, he was really angry at her. He was actually cursing at her in the emergency room, which was very embarrassing for her. Um, and here's what she said. He hates being in the hospital, but what could I do? The pain was terrible, and I couldn't reach the doctor, and you know what happened when she tried. I couldn't move him myself, so I called the ambulance. It was the only thing I could do. Who's abusing the emergency room? This is our healthcare system. Right? The only place that has to take you after 5 o'clock is the 911 call and the ambulance. There is no safety net other than that. So um, here's what happened before we met him. Four calls to 911 in a three-month period, leading to four ED visits and three hospitalizations, leading to a very bad hospital-acquired infection that he wouldn't have gotten if he had stayed home. He um, became incontinent because he was in restraints. The bed rails were up um, because they were afraid he would fall if he got out of bed. So he became incontinent, which he wasn't. 
before he came to the hospital, um, and the stress and anxiety of his wife, you know, got higher every day. So what did we do? The first thing we did was give a really tiny dose of morphine to him, 2.5 milligrams of liquid morphine, and just watch him, see how he tolerated it. So we just sat there. Actually, they put us, we have a geriatric emergency room now, and there's, there are some rooms where you can actually be away from the insanity of the ED, and we were in one of those rooms with the two of them. And while we were watching him, we just asked Mrs. B how things are going. And we just listened. And how things were going is that she couldn't leave the house because he couldn't come because of his pain. So she was homebound, essentially. She couldn't go to the grocery store or to church or out with her friends because if she left him alone, she was terrified that he would fall or hurt himself. So she wasn't grocery shopping, so what were they eating? Chinese. Because in New York, you can pick up the phone and order just about anything, but all she was used to ordering was Chinese. That was all that was in their refrigerator. She couldn't get her hair done. She couldn't get close to the dry cleaners. She didn't know about Fresh Direct. Those of you who don't live in New York might not know either, but in New York, you can, you know, on the computer, order whatever you want and it'll come, but she didn't have a computer and didn't know about it. Um, so they were basically both homebound um, and really socially isolated. And she was determined to keep taking care of him, didn't want any help in the house, didn't want anyone coming in, but was clearly depressed and coming to the end of her rope, I would say. So we gave him a little pain medicine. We listened to her for about an hour. Um, we connected them with a program we have called Visiting Doctors, which is actually a house calls program, and it's not just doctors. It's nurses, it's social workers, it's advanced practice nurses, and it's doctors who go to your house instead of you coming to us. But the great thing about them, aside from that they come to your house, is that they have a 24-7 phone number. So there's no more 911. So if somebody hits the floor at 6.30 p.m., somebody goes to the house to help. And you know, partly because I have connections and partly because he was a palliative care patient, they saw him the next day. He, you know, he jumped to the top of the queue. Palliative care patients typically jump to the top of the queue. Um, so it turns out that she, in particular, was quite a religious person and had been a very active member of their church nearby and hadn't been able to go in two years. And for reasons I still don't know, the pastor had not reached out to her and she had completely lost contact. So we called, the, we called. Um, and they had a friendly visitor program where they send members of the congregation and they also had a friendly visitor program that had high school students on community service. So what they set up was three afternoons a week. Somebody comes from three to six, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hang out with Mr. B and Mrs. B gets out. I mean, it was a phone call was really not very difficult. Um, we also got her daughter to order Fresh Direct, which she was happy to do. I don't think she knew that her parents were eating Chinese food. Um, we arranged Meals on Wheels to reduce the cooking burden and preparation burden on her. Um, we set up the Friendly Visitor Program. That was two years ago. He has not once been back to the ED or the hospital. Um, now you tell me, is this better quality? Is it cheaper? Why is it cheaper? Because it is better quality. So the key important understanding that regular people understand but policymakers tend not to understand is that the way that palliative care reduces spending is by improving quality. And if you don't improve the quality, you don't save money. So all this death panel language and these accusations that palliative care is about rationing, it's about euthanasia, are exactly wrong. It's just the opposite. In fact, hospitals are the third leading cause of death in the United States. They are. That's not an exaggeration. Risk of hospitalization, especially in people like Mr. B, is enormous. 
people are much safer at home. So is his experience unusual? No, it turns out that, you know what the term ars moriendi is? The art of dying was something people used to talk about a lot in the Victorian era. People thought about how they died and whether they left an appropriate legacy for their children and all kinds of things like that. So the ars moriendi of our era is the emergency room because you cannot get off the planet without going through the emergency room. And, and in fact, there was a great New Yorker cartoon that I need to get a copy of and make a slide of that showed an MRI machine in the doorway to the ER. So first you get the MRI, then you go to the emergency room because that actually is the ritual. That's actually what happens. Um, follow the money. So Mr. B, remember I told you 10% of Medicare beneficiaries account for two thirds of spending? Think about Mr. B. He exemplifies the high risk, high cost Medicare beneficiary. He is cognitively impaired. He is, needs another person to get through the day. He's functionally impaired and he's frail. He can't walk a block. He can't get across the room really without some assistance or a walker. He doesn't have, I mean he has dementia but it's certainly not end stage dementia. He does not have cancer. He does not have heart failure. He does not have emphysema. He's old and frail. That's the high risk, high cost population. And right now the system we have to take care of people like him is 911. Okay. So these are data just to support what I just asserted all the way on the right there. Those are the top 5% of Medicare beneficiaries and two thirds of them are functionally dependent on another person. So if you had to choose one characteristic to identify who is at highest risk, it would be that they need another person to get through the day. Do we ask that on any of our electronic health records? We don't. We sure got your social security number and your insurance information, your address, but not whether you need another person to get through the day, even though that is probably the most important characteristic determining your future. These are data showing that if you're severely frail, the bottom curve, meaning you can't walk a block basically because you're too weak, that your risk of death within one year is about 50%. So frailty would be another key predictor of who's at very high risk. And then lastly, these data are really powerful because they show the comparison of how much medical spending occurs in dementia patients versus non-dementia patients. So on the right is the healthy community dwelling older adults and on the left is the demented community dwelling older adults and everything about these two groups is the same except one group has dementia and the other group doesn't. And you can see for yourself that there's a huge increase in medical spending in the dementia group compared to the non-dementia group. Now maybe you guys in this audience can explain to me what is it about dementia that makes the medical care so much more expensive. And you have the clue in the story of Mr. B. The caregiver. So when the caregiver has reached the end of usually her rope and has, you know, just is about to fall apart, oh yeah, fine, send him to the nursing home. Send, call 911, oh please take him in the hospital. It's the caregivers that are driving this utilization because we abandon them completely. And the only thing we offer is what the worst possible care setting. So um, right now, uh, it's up to about $300 billion per year that we're spending just on dementia, more than cancer and heart disease combined. And when my generation gets there, watch out. It's a big, generation um, and over the age of 85, half of us have dementia, moderate to severe dementia. So we ain't seen nothing yet. Why is that though? Why is it that people who need another person to get through the day and are cognitively impaired use so much hospital care and nursing home care and ER care and ICU care? And the answer, a lot of the answer is on this slide. So what this slide is, is the ratio of medical to social spending in all, a lot of other countries and our country. 
And the very tall bars, one is Poland, one is the UK, another one is Denmark, they spend $2.50 on social supports for every dollar they spend on medical care. So guess which bar is the United States? We spend about 60 cents on social supports for every dollar we spend on medical care. So what happens? You call 911, that's the only choice you have. So I learned about this firsthand when I went to visit Cicely Saunders when she was dying in London. I went to see her because she was the founder of the modern palliative care movement. And I went to pay my respects and thank her on behalf of my American colleagues. And she lived in one of these traditional British, you know, narrow, tall row houses with a couple of scraggly rose bushes in the front. You walk in the door, and on the left is the kitchen, on the right is the sitting room, then there's a steep flight of steps up to the loo, which is on the landing, the water closet, and then another steep flight of steps to the bedroom. And she had metastatic cancer, was walking with a walker and taking Oxycontin and Oxycodone and living alone. How, I was asking myself. And I finally couldn't help myself. I asked her, how are you managing here by yourself? I saw the steps. Oh, she said, oh, I have the tuck-in service. Yeah. Tuck-in service? What's that? I'd never heard of the tuck-in service. So in UK, which has a national health service, high school graduates would come to the house every morning at 8, go upstairs, help her get up, bathe, dress, get down the steps very slowly fix her breakfast, lay out the meds, put lunch in the fridge, settle her in the sitting room, and leave. And 12 hours later, somebody reversed it. So there was dinner delivered, like a Meals on Wheels thing. She stayed home till the last two weeks of her life by herself, because they have a tuck-in service, which we cannot do in this country, because we don't pay for it. It's really so simple. Um, the things that people need are not paid for. Here's some examples of the US finally figuring this out. Um, these are, it used to be, some of you, the social workers in the room will know this, that in order to get Medicaid, which is a means-tested program, to pay for your nursing home, you had to be in the nursing home, or you couldn't get Medicaid support for a home health aide or a nursing assistant to help you. Um, of course, the result of that was that people who didn't want to go into nursing homes and didn't need to be in nursing homes ended up in nursing homes because it was the only way they could get the Medicaid support. But of course, it costs a lot. So finally, a bunch of states thought, oh, maybe we should rebalance Medicaid and put the money in home and community-based services. And 25 states did that, and guess what? Cost one-third of what putting the same people in the nursing home cost. It's a, it's a famous Churchill quote. He said, well, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried all the other things first. <laughs> this is a really good example. Um, and here's another example. You guys may remember the sequester of a few years ago when major social programs were cut um, at the insistence of a certain party. Um, and this was published in Health Affairs, and we cut the federal budget for Meals on Wheels by 50% at that time. And this analysis showed that if all 48 contiguous states increased by only 1%, the number of older people who got Meals on Wheels, it would prevent nearly 2,000 people on Medicaid from requiring nursing home care. Is this saving us money? No, it's costing us a huge amount of money. But we cut the food because we don't pay for social supports. So I think the important point I wanted to make in using the Mr. B story is A, he is the exemplar palliative care patient. He's not dying of cancer. He's not dying. In fact, he's doing OK. He's 90. Um, would I have been surprised if someone had asked me, would you be surprised if Mr. B died in the next year? I would have said, no, I wouldn't be surprised. But I, I'm also not surprised that he's still alive now that his needs are being met. So it's not about care of the dying. It's based on need, not prognosis. And this definition comes from talking to the public about what they want in palliative care. And you'll see that it, it's an added layer of support. And it's based on need, not how long you have to live. Not the top, but the bottom. 
So hopefully all of you are working in environments where you don't have to be dying to get the kind of care that you're trying to provide. Um, if Mr. B had had to be dying, he wouldn't have gotten palliative care. So let me ask you another question. Many, many people believe that a huge amount of money is spent on care of people in the last year of life. So I'm going to ask you to give me your best guess on if you take the costliest 5% of patients, and that's your circle, how much of the costliest 5% do you think is accounted for by people in the last 12 months of their life? Anybody's guess? 100%. Who else? 70%. 85%. Eleven percent. There's this kind of myth out there that we're wasting huge amounts of money on care of the dying. Aside from the fact that the dying are the sickest and have the greatest need, so we should be spending money on them, right? That's who needs medical care. It's only eleven percent of the costliest five percent. Who are the rest? Who's the other ninety percent? So nearly half are people who have very high cost but get better. They have their aortic valve replaced. They have their bone marrow transplant. They have their lung transplant or heart transplant. They get their ventricular assist device. Very, very high cost this year, but next year their costs drop back down. So those are the people who are benefiting from all this spending, right? It helps them. And then the rest are the Mr. B's of the world. Every year, high cost because we don't provide social support or support to family caregivers. So if you're a policymaker, you want to focus on the blue and the red because that's where there's this huge mismatch between the system and what people actually need. And the data show very clearly that palliative care models, no matter where they are, whether they're in hospitals or cancer centers or home care or in nursing homes, markedly improve the quality of care. And by improving the quality of care, markedly reduce the need for emergency room visits and hospitalizations. So the work you guys are doing is suddenly in the, what's the word, on the radar screen of policymakers because of this, because the work you guys are doing by improving quality markedly reduces spending. So what's happening is the entire policy world and the for-profit healthcare world are moving very aggressively into this space in the kind of work we are doing. And you need to be aware of that. Some of them are good guys, some of them aren't but they, they, they see these data and they figured it out. And so there's both high quality and low quality investment in the delivery of palliative care. Um, spotty, variable in our nation, but it's happening. And these are just studies that show what I said, which is that palliative care improves quality of life. This study is important because it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is our most prominent medical journal, and this was a randomized study, so it was really good science. Half the people with newly diagnosed lung cancer got usual care at Harvard, and the other half got usual care plus palliative care at the same time, and um, you can see the outcomes here, but to everyone's shock and surprise, and the reason this made it into the New England Journal, the people who got both lived almost three months longer than the people who got usual care to the shock, not only of the investigators, but all my colleagues at Mount Sinai who could not believe this. They called me on the phone and said, what's wrong with the study? This can't be true. But why might it be true? Why might it, let's say for the sake of argument that it is true, that it is replicated, and this finding has been replicated in about five other studies. Why might palliative care prolong life? People feel better and they live longer. That's, there's actually some science, mostly in mice, that supports that. That um, 
there was a study in Cell that I should make into a slide of immunosuppressed mice. So they had gotten like steroids and other immunosuppressive drugs. And they were randomized to best animal lab practices. So they were alone in a clean cage. They got the right kind of food, but uh, that's it. No stimulation, alone in a cage, clean food. The intervention group were in much more interesting cages with other mice and toys and chamois cloth, and music, and were held and stroked by the lab staff. Which group do you think lived longer? <laughs> you could argue that th these were immunosuppressed mice. They shouldn't be exposed to all this risky, infectious stuff. So the, the more interesting social environment mice live four times longer. And um, I didn't know about this study, but some basic scientist happened to be at a talk I was giving, and he stood up when I presented this study and told me about that study and said, we, in, in our lab, we looked at each other and said, we're wasting our lives. Because wow. <laughs> the thing that really affected lifespan was social support, not drugs, not anything else they were doing. Yet, uh, this does not seem to influence how we spend Medicare and Medicaid dollars, yet. Um, interestingly, and I really like this model, this was a great article in the New Yorker in their innovation issue called The Sense of an Ending, which is about nursing home care. The program is called Comfort Matters, and um, they, flip, they flip the nursing home. So in the typical nursing home, everybody gets up at 7, bathe, dress, breakfast, lunch at noon, dinner at 5. You know, it's very regimented to try to make things easier for the staff, to try to make sure that people get their PT and their OT and their this and their that. But it is completely unresponsive to the people living there as individuals. And this place flips that on its head. Um, people can sleep all day and be up all night. If they want to eat peanut butter and jelly at 3 in the morning, no problem. If they don't want to bathe and prefer to be sponge bathed in their room privately, no problem. If they start getting agitated and screaming, they don't give Haldol or restrain them. They assume it's due to pain. You know, just the analogy I use is, you know, many of us were parents. And when our, our, our parents, and when our children start screaming and crying, we do not give them Haldol. And we don't restrain them. We assume that they are uncomfortable. Why do we not assume that when people have dementia? It's so bizarre, because it's like we put all our instincts to the side. Um, so they assume that it's pain or discomfort. They check for constipation. They check for urinary retention. They give morphine. Um, What's interesting about this setting is that normally in nursing homes, the home health aides turn over at about 100% every year because the work is torture. They're torturing the residents. The residents are torturing them. They get paid nothing. There's no career path. There's like almost no turnover in this nursing home. And the interviews, the videos on the websites for this place, you, they have interviews with the aides who, you know, their pleasure and their joy in their work just flows off the screen. They love their residents. Um, they're hugging them all the time. It's like a family. Um, so hopefully that'll be there when we need it. <laughs> so um, the way that we identify um, patients is key. Now, why did Mr. B have to come to the ED four times? before somebody figured out that we needed a different care plan. Because there was no targeting mechanism in place. There was no way to identify people that were at high risk like him. Um, and what's interesting is that if you look at, I don't think you can see this red dot, but this is a group of primary care docs who were asked to identify their patients who they wouldn't be surprised if they died in the next year. And you might have thought most of them would have cancer or heart disease. Nope. 55% had dementia and frailty. So not that hard to identify people. We just don't do it. Um, 
So ask yourself this question. Would you be surprised? It's a pretty good predictor. Ask yourself, does this person have decreased function or are they confused and unable to take care of themselves or make decisions? Those people are at very high risk. Those are the people who need you to lean in and figure out a different plan. The second key thing we have to do besides targeting is find out what matters to people and not assume that we know. Because no matter how good the care is that we're providing at home, if we don't know what someone's goal is when they next have their crisis, the, the default is the 911 call. So you have to have the conversation first. And this is what one mother of a um, genetically um, impaired child said to me, don't ask what's the matter with me, ask what matters to me. And actually when I'm training house staff and fellows, I, I ask them to ask this question. What is most important to you? What is most important to you? No one has ever answered that question, I want to live forever. They say things like, I'm hoping to see my garden in the spring. I want to make it till my next grandchild is born. I want someone to help my wife. So this is, a, let me, this is another quiz for you guys. This is a 360 senior center, older adults, who were asked what their priorities for care were between three things. Living longer, having relief of distressing symptoms, um, or remaining independent. Wow, you guys are good. 76% remaining independent, followed by pain and symptom management with staying alive dead last. And where does all the money go? Right, total flip from patients' priorities to what we do. Then the third issue is, we've talked about this, Mrs. B and the other exhausted family caregivers. The actual estimate is now up to 500 billion, half a trillion dollars out of pocket from family caregivers that we just basically don't support at all, that we exploit. Many of these people are giving injections, doing wound care, laying out medicines in medisets with no training and support, and guess what the number one cause of personal bankruptcy is in the United States? The only developed country on the planet where medical care is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy is our country. Um, so clearly, families need help, and there's no, you cannot just focus on the patient. The family is as much the focus of our care as the patient. And that means meaningful 24-7 responsiveness. And I use the word meaningful intentionally. It's not good enough to call and leave a message and two hours later not have heard back, which is the typical situation. So as I mentioned to you before, insurers have figured out which side their bread is buttered on, that getting care to people in their homes with palliative care type skills saves them a ton of money. So it's our job to make sure that this is being done to improve quality and to be sure that the care that's provided actually is responsive to the needs of patients. Um, and this is just one example of what's going on. Have you guys ever heard of DeVita? It's this huge multinational dialysis company, for profit. When Obamacare passed, their profits dropped from about a 22% margin to a 2% margin because dialysis got bundled instead of being fee-for-service. There was a fixed rate. So they freaked out, because how were they going to get their shareholder returns? So they decided to buy a community-based palliative care practice. I'm not kidding. And they're making a 15% positive margin on it. Because risk-bearing models like Medicare Advantage, Medicaid Managed Care, will pay them good money, a per member per month rate, to keep people out of the hospital. Now some of these guys are competent and well-trained and know how to deliver high quality care, and some of them don't. So we have a big challenge in front of us to make sure that the care provided this very vulnerable population is actually person-centered and responsive and high quality. 
The fourth issue is Mr. B. He doesn't have cancer pain, he has arthritis. Everybody has arthritis. But doctors and nurses do not know how to manage pain from arthritis. We were none of us taught. Um, and these data show that the most severe pain that older people have in their last months of life is due to arthritis. And we don't treat it. We need to learn how to treat it. Um, and lastly, as with Mr. B, he needed very intensive services in the few weeks after his fourth ED visit. But he basically gets a visit from the visiting docs program, nurse practitioner, once a month. And then he has that 24-7 phone call number if he needs it. But if there's a crisis, that team will lean in and get there right away and help. So the model has to be able to dose adjust based on people's need. Less or just phone access when people are stable and getting a human being to the house within an hour when they're not stable. That bears no relationship to the current healthcare system. That's the direction we have to go in. So what do we have to do? One of the things we have to do is what you're doing here, which is learn. Learn all the workforce. The, doc, the whole team which is here, doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, administrators, need to learn how to take high quality care of this patient population. Right now, the vast majority of us had no training in any of this, and that is still the case in medical schools, nursing schools, social work schools. It's a huge problem. We need to train every clinician. So I thank uh, Koshin and Chodo for contributing to that urgent need for training and improvement in quality. And this famous cartoon with a doctor saying to the patient, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. So we, those of us in palliative care think this is a great doctor because he knows that he can't do it. And he doesn't just say, oh, I'll send you off for fifth line chemotherapy, which is what the untrained physician does. Uncomfortable having the conversation. Oh, we'll order another PET scan. I'll send you down the hall for some experimental chemotherapy. It's much faster and more remunerative than having a conversation. But it's a procedure. That doctor was never trained to have this conversation. This is a procedure like a surgical procedure. You wouldn't send an intern in to do an appendectomy without training, a lot of training. Yet we send interns in to have these conversations every day with no training, as if somehow people are born knowing how to do it. Not true. But it can be taught. It can be taught. It just needs to be taught. Um, I think the second big issue, and we were talking about this earlier, is the need for public awareness. And there's two reasons for the need for public awareness. One is, if people know what they could be getting, they will demand it. They'll be angry that they're not getting it. Increasingly, people come to our hospital and demand palliative care. And the physician says, oh, you're not dying. You don't need palliative care. And the family member says, palliative care is not just for the dying doctor. I want palliative care. I read that palliative care prolongs life. We actually had one of our residents who graduated a few years ago was diagnosed about a month ago with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she decided to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering, the you know, cancer hospital to the stars in Manhattan because the best Hodgkin's guy in the city is there. And on her initial meeting with him, she said, do you have palliative care involved with your team? And he said, oh no, you don't need palliative care. You're not dying. And she said, I'm not going through this without palliative care. So she's getting her palliative care from us uptown because she trained with us. So she knows what it is because she saw it. And she's getting her cancer care at Sloan. We get more people like that who know what the difference is and start demanding it, we will start seeing change. So public demand is key to change. But the other reason that public demand is important is what? People can get better care if they know what they need and they know that it exists. But what else? Policy change. How do we get policy change? There's two ways. Money pay off your elected representatives? Well, that's how most stuff happens. 
but we don't have money. So we've got to go the harder way. Organize. Organize, exactly. We have to have public demand. We have to have the public really mad, really angry about what they're getting and knowing that it doesn't have to be that way and demanding that their taxpayer dollars are spent in a way that actually helps. Otherwise, we will not get policy change because we don't have the money to pay for it. So this is an example of the public awareness work that uh, CAPSI has been doing with the American Cancer Society. There's a series of four ads. What it says is palliative care sees the person beyond the cancer treatment. You see it cancer in black aerial font, and then the purple vertical says dancer, and then the next one it says chemotherapy, and it's crossed out, and it says mother. The third ad is um, a father and his young daughter, and it says radiation, and everything is crossed out in the word, and it says dad. And the fourth ad is a, um, a kid on a swing in a playground, and it says stage four, and then it crosses out the ST. Like, don't try this at home. This is like expensive Madison Avenue advertising firm here. Um, but it's really powerful, and it's really effective. And you see, if you go to the Washington Post online, you will see these banner ads. And it has to be repeated, and it has to be repeated through social media and print media and television and radio. Um, my friend Ira Bayak here is, you know, an exemplar of a leader in the field of palliative care is working really, really hard through his books and through other forms of media to empower the public about this. So what we need to do is we need to go from thinking about terminal illness to thinking about chronic illness, from short prognosis to indeterminate prognosis from cancer to all serious illness, from disease to condition. Remember, it's functional impairment, frailty, dementia, that are the real drivers. From mortality to prevalence, from cure versus care to both. From disease or palliation to both. From prognosis as criterion to need as criterion. From reactive, like Mr. B, to screening. And preventive. If he had been, even after that first ED visit, so much misery averted, so much waste averted. From specialist care to every single clinician who takes care of patients knowing what they're doing. And we are so far from that. We have a lot of work to do. From institutional care to care at home, which is what people want from complete lack of regional planning, which characterizes the United States, to a public health approach, and from fragmented care to integrated care. So that's where we are now. We need to get to the place on the right. And you guys are the soldiers in that army. And I'm incredibly, uh, what's the word, inspired that you're here, and nourished by the fact that you're here, and feel much less alone because of the fact that you're here. Um, it's going to take all of us pulling in the same direction with the same messages, um, joining our voices to get there. And um, William Gibson is a science fiction writer who said the future is here now. It's just not very evenly distributed. <laughs> so you guys are the future. Distribute yourselves. Thank you so much.